This past Friday, my wife and I were taking a short trip down to Temple, Texas to deliver a puppy for our daughter. Our daughter lives in San Antonio, and she felt it would help us a bit if we just met halfway-ish in Temple. So along the way, uh, as we're driving down 35, I receive a phone call from one of our elders who shall remain nameless. When I told him where we were going, along in that conversation, he said, oh, that reminds me, uh, when I come back from sabbatical, I'm going to bring you up on charges for blasphemy because of all the bad things you've said about Bucky's. (laughs) And then he proceeded to practically draw me a map. I think he might have even sent me one to say, this is where Bucky's is in Temple, encouraging me to go there. And I want to say publicly that I took all of that to heart. And I got to tell you, there is, in fact, a Bucky's in Temple. And I saw it on my way into Temple and on my way out of Temple. <laughs> and my heart was hardened as we passed it both times. <laughs> and to clarify, Bucky's for me is like the mega church of fuel stations and convenience stores. <laughs> and, and I'm not about that life, so. <laughs> I look forward to my trial in the fall. (laughs) On a more serious note, we are returning to our series on the Sermon on the Mount today. And we are in that part of the sermon where Jesus is deconstructing the hyper-religious, hypocritical uses of God's law that were found among the, the Pharisees. And he's also reconstructing holy uses of God's law for the sake of his followers. And that is why you hear him say things like, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Same is true in this passage today. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Now, I grant that on the surface, it sounds like Jesus is saying that It is absolutely wrong to take oaths or to make vows in any and all circumstances. But that is simply not the case. Jesus is saying that it is absolutely wrong to take extravagant, excessive, exaggerated oaths and vows, especially when you do them under false pretense. It's like people in our day who might say, I swear on a stack of Bibles 10 feet tall that what I'm about to tell you is the truth. Or like when I was a little kid, we said things like, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye if I break my word. Or maybe we sound like that Spaniard who lowered a rope to a desperate man on the side of a cliff and said, I swear on the soul of my father, you will reach the top of life. (laughs) The religious folks in Jesus' day made elaborate oaths to impress others, whether they intended to keep those oaths or not. So for them, it wasn't primarily about keeping the vow, performing the oath. It was about winning people over to your side. And Jesus is deconstructing that practice by pointing out that God's law does in fact require us to swear by the name of God alone, full stop. Three examples from the law. Leviticus 19, you shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Numbers 30, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, He shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Exodus 20. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. 
for the Lord God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. In his book, 12 Rules for Life, Jordan Peterson says, you can use words to manipulate the world into delivering what you want. This is what it means to act politically. This is spin. It's the specialty of unscrupulous marketers, salesmen, advertisers, pickup artists, slogan-possessed utopians, and psychopaths. I would add some pastors. It's the speech people engage in when they attempt to influence and manipulate others. This is the very thing the Pharisees were trying to do by making their vows and their oaths in these elaborate ways. They were superstitious about God's name, but they also wanted what they wanted. And so they had to figure out how they could swear by God's name and get what they want. But how could they do that if they couldn't even bring themselves to utter the name of God? Here's what they did. It's the same kind of thing that we might do. They figured out a way to get around this conundrum by creating a buffer zone around God's law between themselves and God's law. And they were teaching their followers to do the same things. And what I mean is this, that instead of teaching and practicing that the law of God says we must swear by the name of God alone, they said simply, don't swear by the name of God, that's getting too close to the Holy One. What you can do instead is swear by things that are related to God or associated with God, and that way they could leave themselves an out. You see, if they break those oaths and those vows, then they're not really offending God in their way of thinking. They're just offending or violating the things that are kind of close to God. And so they felt like it gave them a way of escape. It kept them from blasphemy. It kept them from profaning the name of God. It kept them from breaking God's law in their own mind. So what they were doing was flattering God and man, but also leaving themselves an out. What does Jesus say about this? Jesus says, it doesn't matter if you swear by holy things, holy places, or holy people. It doesn't change one thing. It doesn't make your oath truer. It doesn't make your vow better. Actually, it makes them both worse. And it probably makes them both untrue in the sight of God. Because you are protesting too much. You're speaking too many things. You're trying too hard to win the favor of God and man. Jesus tells us that we should never, ever take or make vows in that kind of way. And what he is telling us is that we need to learn to speak the language of God. We need to learn to speak the language of God, not the language of the devil. And we're kind of hardwired to speak the language of the devil, inheriting that from our parents, Adam and Eve. We live in a world that's fallen, and we've learned to speak that language from infancy on. We've got to learn to speak the language of God. So instead of speaking lies... Like the father of lies, we we must speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. Because apart from God's help, we're not going to learn to speak this language. And when we talk about not telling lies and not speaking the language of the devil, we need to include in that things like speaking half-truths. Half-truths. Because remember what a half-truth is? It's a half-lie. And if you're speaking half-lies, you're not telling the truth. You're not letting your yes be yes or your no be no. You're doing something that comes from evil. So Jesus is trying to simplify things for us, take away the complexities of our speech and conversation to say, we've got to be honest with each other. We've got to speak frankly with each other and show integrity in our speech. It doesn't mean we get to be jerks. It means we get to tell the truth to each other in a loving and gracious way but it does mean we have to tell each other the truth. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ teaches us that out of the overflow of our hearts, the mouth speaks. You see, the trouble with the Pharisees, and then sometimes those of us who read the Sermon on the Mount, we kind of do the same thing as the Pharisees, is we just focus on the mouth and the words that come past our lips and the speech that is formed inside of our mouths and flows off our tongue but we're not getting to the source. 
And so you'll find people say, well, you can't say these words in this way or say things like that because those are bad ways to speak and that's bad language. Jesus is saying, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So go deeper and find out what is it about you, what is it about me that causes us to speak half-truths? What is it about us that causes us to say yes and no and to dance back and forth and to waver between two sides? What is it about us that prevents us from telling the truth, letting our yes be yes and our no, no? Well, the problem is in our hearts. We need a change of heart. The scripture says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart... This person's religion is worthless. Now, I know we live in a time where people love to say, well, uh, I'm spiritual but not religious. But I got to tell you, Jesus was religious and he wants his people to be religious. And the religion he wants needs to be pure. It needs to be right and good religion. So there's a bad religion. And if you're against that, I'm against that as well. But I'm also for this good religion where we are tied back to Christ and the things of God. And this is what Jesus wants, a worthy religion from his people. How do you get there? Well, you get there certainly by a change of heart, but then by practicing what Jesus teaches. One way to do that is to be careful how you use your language, your words, your speech. Speak the truth in love. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Yesterday, my family and I made our annual pilgrimage down to Scarborough Fair Renaissance Festival. That's right. Only God can judge me. (laughs) Enduring one of my favorite acts, the Harmless Danger Juggling Show, the performer stood up on the stage and warned us that he was about to perform a trick using fire on the end of sticks And he insisted that the queen herself had made him promise to make all of us promise that we would never, ever play with fire, not even at home. And so he had all of us raise our right hand to repeat an oath after him. But when he saw that so few people had actually raised their hands, he said, it's just an oath. You don't have to mean it. It's like marriage. It's as if you were there. That's what the crowd said. (laughs) And then he proceeded quickly to rattle off an impossible litany of promises that we could not repeat, keep up with him. And when he finished, he was out of breath. And he said, keep in mind that we are in the medieval world today. And you cannot just scroll to the bottom and click that you agree verbally. You have to listen to all of this. Now, the joke was on us. And we knew it because we are often too fast and too flippant with our words, our promises, our commitments, and our vows. Did you really read all of that before you clicked, I agree? (laughs) Did you really pay attention to the fine print? Or did you just want to get through to the other side? That's how we live life. Even if we mean well, we soon discover that keeping vows is much more difficult and much more costly than making the vows. Talk is cheap. We all know that. Most of us have taken marriage vows. And most of the marriage vows sound like this. In the name of God, I take you to be my husband or wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. We've all taken vows along those lines or to that effect in the presence of God and these witnesses. And no sooner does the honeymoon end than you start to feel the weight of those vows. You feel the weight over those vows over something as small as taking, up, taking out the trash or picking up your shoes, or hanging the toilet paper the correct way in the bathroom. And then the kids come along, and you feel the weight of those vows even more. First, when it comes time to get up in the middle of the night and feed the little critters, and then change diapers, and then they get older. you got to teach them to drive, maybe, and hope you can. And you feel the weight of those vows even more. 
Money gets tighter, life gets crazier, and you feel the weight of those vows even more. And then, by God's grace, you become empty nesters. And some of you have discovered that in that time, you have to find each other all over again. And the weight of those vows can still be felt. Many of you have taken membership vows to become participants in the life of this congregation. Vows that need to be taken seriously, but vows that say this. Do you resolve and promise in humble reliance on the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as become the followers of Christ? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? And in that moment, with all of the excitement of life in a new congregation and people that love you and the vibe and energy of a place like this, you want to say yes to all of those. But no sooner do you take those vows than someone in your community group gets on your nerves and rubs you the wrong way. Or the pastors teach on doctrines that you don't like. The songs are too slow. No, the songs are too fast. The songs are too old or too new. You don't like the lighting. You're encouraged to make tithes and offerings out of your hard-earned money. The elders make a decision you don't like. And worst of all, someone asks you to volunteer in the nursery. <laughs> It's in those moments that the, <laughs> from what I've heard, <laughs> it's in those moments that membership vows can feel awfully heavy. <laughs> and then some of us have taken ministry vows for ordination. And the two that feel the heaviest to me are these. Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in maintaining the truths of the gospel and the purity and peace and unity of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise unto you on that account? Do you engage to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as a Christian and a minister of the gospel, whether personal or relational? private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your manner of life and to walk with exemplary piety before the flock of which God shall make you an overseer. On the day that I took those vows, I trembled with fear. And when I wrote these into the sermon... Once again, I trembled with fear. And even now, in reciting them back to you, I tremble with fear. Why? Because I feel the weight of these vows. Now, there are days when I'm free to ruminate with a pipe in my teeth, a book in my hand, and coffee in my cup. On those days, the vows seem light and easy. But there are many other days, many other days, when the world, the flesh, and the devil assault my soul. And these vows seem heavy. And there are many days when I know that the world, the flesh, and the devil assaults your souls. And I feel the weight of these vows. It feels like Mission Impossible. It's an unbearable weight. And I think the last time I took these vows, I wept because in taking those vows in that moment, I knew I am going to break these vows at some point. At worst or at best, I'm not going to be able to keep all these vows. I probably felt the same way on the day we got married. It's hard to live truthfully with integrity. It's hard to live consistently with the things that come out 
of our mouths. But he gives us more grace. Earlier in the service, we heard a reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. It says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools for they do not know what they are doing, that they're doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what, pay what you vow. It's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. As Peterson said, taking the easy way out or telling the truth, those are not merely two different choices. They are Two entirely different pathways through life. They are utterly different ways of existing. Which path do you want to take? Which path do you want to take? The way of telling the truth or the way of taking it easy with deceit, half lies, and hiding the truth. In his epistle to the scattered church, James wrote, Above all, my brothers... Above all, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by anything other, by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. And we hear that and we think, well, there it is again. We should not take any oaths or make any vows or swear anything before God. But I want to remind you that the Bible is full of stories of men and women that took vows before God. Abraham, Moses, David, and Paul all took vows and swore oaths before the Lord, and God was pleased with them. And why was he pleased with them? He was pleased with them because they did it by faith, and they were condoned for their faithfulness, commended for their faithfulness, not condemned for breaking oaths and vows. But above Abraham, Moses, David, and Paul, as important as they are and as beautiful as their stories might be, I want you to see something here in the Sermon on the Mount and take this with you, that the Lord Jesus Christ also took vows and he made oaths. Jesus practiced what he preached, not only when he became flesh and dwelt among us, but he practiced what he preached even before he became flesh. The scriptures tell us about the Lord Jesus that he is both a promise maker and a promise keeper. And we see this throughout the story of the Bible. He swore an oath to Abraham as the angel of the Lord when he spoke from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Jesus swore an oath to Israel through Moses when he said, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you for you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping his oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. He swore an oath to David I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He swore an oath through the prophets. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other for by myself I have sworn From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. 
So just as Christ swore an oath by himself for the sake of his people, someday all of his people will swear allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ as we bow our knee before him and declare him to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Apostle Paul says that as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is preached among you was not yes and no. But in Christ, it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Jesus is a promise maker and a promise keeper. He practiced what he preached. He took vows and he swore oaths and he kept every word, even on the pain of death, even on the pain of shedding his own blood. He came into the world to testify to the truth and it cost him his life and the life he gave, the life he paid to keep his vow is the life of the world. The Hebrew writer tells us that a single offering has been made by Christ one time for all time to perfect those who are being sanctified. The Holy Spirit bears witness to us and says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. This is the oath, the vow, the covenant that Christ our Lord has sworn with his people. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the body and blood of Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, and let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Because Christ who promised is faithful. Christ who promised is faithful. He practiced what he preached so that we can practice what he preached. And as we practice what he preached, let me encourage you to take your vows in the name of the Lord. To tell the truth always and never lie. To take up your cross and follow him. And to taste and see that the Lord is good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that the word of Christ that we've heard today will not be empty, will not ring hollow, will not return to him without bearing the fruit for which he sent it. We pray that you will use his word to Cleanse us of our sins and conform us to his image. And we pray that as we follow him, bearing the cross and walking in his steps, that we will not fear the world, the flesh, or the devil. We will not fear our own weakness and frailty, but that we will trust in him, in his power and glory, in his mercy and kindness. We pray that you give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to believe all that Christ has spoken to us in the Sermon on the Mount. And as we wrestle with our own tendencies to deceive, to omit truths, to skirt around telling the truth or living by it, that your spirit will convict us and grant us the grace to obey you. We thank you for hearing our prayers and we offer them humbly through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.